Um, we're here today at Kennesaw State University with Major General Retired Ma Maria Britt. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm Kaylee. I'm Chloe. Okay, and we'll just start here. What influenced your decision to go into the military? Well, I didn't know at first that I wanted to go into the military. Um, in fact, when I was more your age, I was actually thinking about going t into the church. I was thinking about being a nun. And I was heavily influenced by the sound of music and Love that musical, still do. But then, uh, 1976, Congress authorized women to attend the service academies, and this was like landmark legislation for women, because never before had women been allowed to go into West Point, Annapolis Air Force Academy. I was a freshman in high school, and my dad sat down with me, and he said, you know what, you might want to think about this. I was a cross-country runner, I was very self-disciplined when it came to my grades, pretty much had straight A's. Uh, liked to lead. I was always in charge of whatever we were doing, whether it was 4-H or playing school or you know whatever. So my dad said, you know, you've got the credentials to do this. You could be successful. It'll be tough, but once you come out, you're going to be a great leader, and then you'll be in the military. And that's serving a greater good. And that's what I wanted with the church. I, I just felt the calling to be a servant leader. And now this opened up another door for me and an opportunity to be a leader and still serve serve my country now. So that's what influenced me. My, my dad sitting down and talking to me. Now my mom wasn't all for it. She was a little skeptical and now it's kind of tough on girls and her baby and women hadn't quite started coming into the military. So, you know, they, they didn't view women who went into the military in a very good light. So I had to overcome that stereotype and that perception. My aunts kind of, you know, looking down their nose a little bit at the fact that I was going to join the military. But I didn't let that deter me because I knew it was a, a great institution and needed my leadership. So that's why I, I went to West Point. And then when you come out of West Point, you're obligated to serve five years in the military. And I didn't know what I was going to do when I came out of West Point, but I, I just enjoyed serving and being a lieutenant. And all of a sudden, then I was a captain, and I really didn't want to get out. But life happens, and I had two small children, and I had to make a decision whether to stay in and keep moving around every two to three years, or get out, find another career where I could still lead and add value and raise my children. Right, and then our second question is, what made you want to go to the West Point Military Academy when traditionally it was a male school? Okay, so it was a challenge. I was like, all right, I'm going to do ROTC anyway. So that's the uh, Reserve Officer Training Corps. So I, I had already applied to ROTC. I had gotten accepted. I applied to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I'm from upstate New York, so RPI, very well-known engineering school, mostly men. And I knew I wanted to do math and science because I was good at it. And my dad had always told me, do math and science because you're going to make more money in those fields. And for women, you're going to make less anyway, so you might as well go for the fields that are going to make more money. So when you make less, it's not as bad. <laughs> so if you understand all that. And you will someday when you're looking at your... Uh, your, your peer, your male peer's paycheck, and you're looking at your paycheck. So I had been accepted to RPI in Cornell, and then the letter to West Point came in. It was January 2nd, and I'll never forget it, because I got it, and I was just so nervous, and I already knew I had been accepted to these other two colleges. I was going to do ROTC, and then when I opened that letter, it was like, yes, congratulations. And I'm like, you know, what do I do now? Do I going for the college experience where I know I'm probably going to have some fun, maybe it's not going to be as tough, and maybe I'll make more money, or am I going to go with West Point, where I'll be the fourth class of women, I'll still be breaking ground, it'll be so much harder, and I'm going to have to put up with so much more harassment and stuff, but what's going to be better for me in the long run? Do I, I go for the easier, more fun, or do I go for the harder challenge? And I decided 
I was going to go for it. And that's what helped me make up my mind. I just knew I wanted to, to do the harder right over the easier or wrong. And it was, none of it could have been wrong, but I just, I wanted the challenge. I wanted to see if I could do it. And I did. What point in your life did you decide you wanted to become a general? Uh, I, you don't really ever decide you want to be a general. I never did. I mean, I I always wanted to be the best leader I could be at whatever rank. And and even today, if, if I'm in uniform and a lieutenant comes up to me and says, oh, I want to be a general just like you, I said, I'm not going to wish that on you. Be the best lieutenant that you can be. Learn. Enjoy the time with your soldiers. Because every rank that you go into that's higher, you get further and further away from being with the soldiers that you love to work with. And, and so I just, I, I never really wanted to be a general. In fact, the first time, it, I was actually in the National Guard already, and I was a captain, and a general officer came up to me, Cecil Pierce, and he said to me, when you get promoted to general someday, I want you to invite me back. And I was like, oh, he's crazy. I'm never going to make general, especially not in the Georgia Army National Guard. <laughs> so, but it was just, you know, that was the first time I ever thought about it when this general had this confidence already and he already saw my leadership traits and he already knew I was going to be successful, but he had more confidence in me than I had in myself at the time. So I, I didn't ever really want to be a general. It, it gets to the point where you have to make the decision, are you going to step up and are you going to be that leader? Or are you going to let somebody else step up? Or are you going to work for them? And in most cases, the people that I would have had to have worked for, I didn't want to work for. So it motivated me to step up and, and put more risk in my life, to be more exposed to criticism. I mean, it only gets harder. It, it's not, you know, people think, oh, you're a general, everything's great, you just give orders and things happen. It's not the way it works. You have to have people that trust you, that have confidence in you. You have to have confidence in them. You work together. You create persuasion. You're always doing what's right for the organization. And it, it's a lot of responsibility. And it's very painful. It's, it's more painful than the glory that you think you get out of it. it it's not about that at all. Were there times when you wanted to give up? And what were those times in there? There were only, I would say, two times in my life that I thought about giving up, if you put it that way. The first time was when I was a, a plebe, a freshman at West Point. I had a very rough summer, as you can imagine. Again, think about this. Now, this is back in 1979, 80. They didn't want women at service cabins. The cadre didn't want women. The professors didn't want women. The upperclassmen, the worst were the women, because now I had senior women that wanted to make our life as miserable or more miserable than theirs had been. So they were even more mean to us, and I mean in your face mean, calling you names and trying to degrade you. And it was painful. I'm from upstate New York. I'm from this little town. I'm the oldest of three. I, I, we went to church every week, you know, treat others as you expect to be treated. I wasn't ready for this. And I didn't think I deserved it. And I didn't think it was fair. All right, so, but then you start learning life isn't fair, and sometimes don't take it personally, because it wasn't about Maria Britt. It was about the fact that they didn't want women at service academies. And you're going to find this all throughout your life. It, there's people that have these stereotypes, these biases. And so about halfway through my freshman year, I'd had it. It's, I was trying to study, and I was, they were calling you out in the hallway and screaming at you all the time, and I couldn't sleep at night. Um, you know, my body was going through a lot of stress. I had to go see a doctor, and I finally said, you know, maybe this isn't for me, because if this is what I'm going to have to become to be successful, they can have it. I'm not doing it. This is not me. Uh, it's not true to my values. So I called my dad. And I said, hey, you told me whenever I'm ready to call you and let you know if I couldn't take it anymore, you come down and get me. We're about four hours away. And he said, okay, well, what happened? And I, I said, nothing. I just, you know, I, I can't deal with it anymore. It's not me. And he said, all right, I'll come down tomorrow and I'll get you. And he hung up. 
and I went back upstairs. And I, I probably didn't sleep all night thinking about it because I'm not a quitter. All right, so now, am I going to quit? Am I going to give it up? What about the other women that are here that are going through this? How does that make them feel? Because every time a, a woman left that was my friend, it broke my heart. Because now she was gone, I didn't have that person to lean on. And oh, by the way, now we got extra attention. So I was hurting my buddies by bailing. And I, the more I thought about it, the more I said, no, you know, I will not quit. I will never accept defeat. I'm going to stay. I called my dad back the next morning said, hey, Dad, forget it. I'm going to stay. And he didn't say anything. But I, I could tell he was smiling on the other end. Because he knew I could do it, but he knew I was going through a tough time. And he had, had told me, just like when he gave me that dime and said, you call me. If you're ever out on a date and you need me to come get you, here's a dime. You call me. And I only had to use that dime once. And he never asked me a question why. So, I mean, that, that was the first time I thought about quitting. The second time I thought about quitting was the day my first drill in the Georgia Army National Guard. As I came off of active duty eight years, I was a military police officer, had led 35 men and women as a platoon. I was company commander, had 250 soldiers at Fort McPherson. I was part of criminal investigation division. I had all these great jobs. I come into the Georgia Army National Guard and it's my first day on Confederate Avenue on the hill. And I report in, and I think I, I was given the assignment of Army Communities of Excellence because nobody else wanted to do it. It's one of those, tell the history of your organization. And there was a colonel that was in charge of it that used to be a general, and I don't know what the whole story is, but he was a real angry kind of person, and nobody wanted to work with him. So my first assignment was to do this Army Communities of Excellence and go report to this colonel. So off I go, I'm dressed, I'm sharp, I'm ready. First day, Saturday morning, right, 8 o'clock. And I'm on my way over to this building. And on the way over, there's a colonel that's standing out that I hadn't met yet. And he's got this stogie hanging out of his mouth, and he's drinking his cup of coffee, and he's just enjoying the morning air. And he said, hey, Captain, come over here. So I marched over, yes, sir, good morning, sir. He said, I'm just so glad you're in the Georgia Army National Guard. And I said, well, thank you, sir. I'm proud to be a part of this organization. He said, yeah, we need more good-looking women around here. And I was heartbroken again. And I was like, OMG, are you kidding me? I am not going to deal with this. After all the crap I've had to deal with at West Point, eight years on active duty, and now I'm coming into this organization, and that's my morning greeting? Really? And I remember I called my husband and I said, hey, this isn't going to work. I cannot go through all of this again. And he was like, oh, that, that's Colonel so-and-so. Don't, don't worry about it. He's, he's on his fifth wife. And I'm like, yeah, but how many more of these guys am I going to have to deal with to overcome the stereotype and to let them know that I'm serious about being a leader and I want to do my job. I've been trained for this and now here we go again. And that's, that was the next time I thought about, you know what, this just isn't worth it. But then I found a new mantra, a new essence of wanting to continue to drive on. And it was called one retirement at a time. Because I knew all these older guys, I, I labeled them more dinosaurs, were on their way out. And I knew what they thought about women. And I knew what they were thinking about me. But you know what? I was younger, I was a junior rank, and I was going to be able to outlast them. So one retirement at a time. And it, it worked like a charm. It took a little longer because nobody wants to retire <laughs> from the National Guard. <laughs> uh, but uh, eventually this person did. And, and now it's, it's funny because I went back to him and I told him, I said, you know what you said to me earlier hurt my feelings the first day I came into the Guard. And he's like, well, now what did I say? So I told him, he's like, ah, I was just joking. You know you're a good-looking woman. And I'm like, I know, but I didn't join the Guard to be a good-looking woman. I came here to be a leader. I wanted to be respected as a leader. And he's like, oh. so now we're friends on Facebook, and I think he's on Wife 7, but that's okay. <laughs> and see, it's not personal. See, and, and again, I had taken it personally 
But it's hard not to when it's directed at you. Okay, so those were the two times. <laughs> when you were in Panama, did you realize that you would become a general one day? Uh, no, I was just trying to get through jungle warfare school. It was a two-week school. I was the first woman, my roommate and I were the first two women to go to jungle school. Jungle warfare school, all right? So I didn't even want to go. I wanted to go to northern warfare school where I could repel off of ice glaciers because I was a skier and I love repelling. But oh, actually, I wanted airborne first, but that went like that. So then the next was uh, jungle warfare or northern warfare. And literally, we had to draw straws. The commander came and he had a handful of straws, and whoever drew the shortest draw had to go to jungle school. Well, I never had good luck at anything. So here I go drawing the short straw. And off I go. So it was miserable. It was terrible. The Marines were running it. They didn't want women there. If women succeed, then what's that do? That makes their school look like it's not rough and tough and you know, all that it's built up to be. You know, <laughs> it's just so sad. And that's why I can't wait till a woman finally makes it through Ranger School. <laughs> but my roommate and I, we went. We did a great job. We, our whole cohort from the West Pointers got done two days early, so they decided to add a training module to our two weeks. It's called helicasting. It's where you go up in a big Chinook helicopter, you know, the one that has the two rotors, and they drop down the back gate, and then you jump out about 100, 150 feet into the Bay of Panama. You got your weapon above your head, you got your full gear on, they throw this RB-15 out, it's a rubber boat, it inflates, you know, swim to the boat, get in, assault the shore. Typical marine operation. So they decided they were gonna add this on at the end of our little two week experience since we had two days left and they didn't know what to do with us. So off we go, we practice jumping and what we're gonna do and the day comes so we go up in the helicopter. And it was a little windy, the water's a little rough. The pilots, this was their first run. And so when I jumped out, I landed a little bit flatter than I should have. And my weapon that was above my head, my elbows didn't stay locked and my weapon came down on the bridge of my nose and it, it broke my nose in two places. All right, so now I've got a face full of blood. I knocked myself out. One of my, we, we jumped two at a time. We had a buddy uh, process where you would, as soon as you were up, you would look left or right. And, and my buddy noticed my face was still in the water because I had knocked myself out. So he came over and pulled my head out, flipped me on my back, flagged on the boat. So here come the Marines. Right? Oh, wonderful. A woman gets hurt. So they drag me into the boat, and I'm bleeding all over the place. And <laughs> I'll never forget, the Marine says, hey, don't bleed on my shorts. And I look, and, and they wear white. You know, the Marines have white shorts. And I'm thinking to myself, who wears white in the jungle? But I, I didn't worry about it. So they get me in the boat. Next thing I know, more screaming and yelling. Well, another one of my classmates had done the same thing, but this time it was a guy. His weapon came down on his upper lip, ripped his lip off, and knocked out his two front teeth. Oh, All right, so here they're dragging him in the boat. <laughs> and we're both in the boat, just bleeding up a storm all over this boat. And the sad thing was we were so far into the jungle, because we were jumping into one of the lakes that they had, that they couldn't bring us back. They had to do a second run first to see if anybody else would get hurt. Then they would bring us in. Well, on the second run, they went slower and lower. Nobody got hurt. So off my classmate and I go, and, and we get sewed up. They didn't even have a real clinic. There was a vet clinic. And they ended up using my horse thread on my nose. And I remember the little medic, because every time they would go to stick the needle in my nose, he would squeeze my hand. And finally, I said, hey, buddy, I know you're trying to help me out here, but every time you squeeze my hand, I know that needle's going in my nose. Do you mind? <laughs> and he's like, Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the last day, the whole time, the cadre is trying to take a picture of me, right? They're trying to get in front of me. And I'm, I'm always blocking, and, and my friends, my classmates were helping me. But it was the last meal, and I was carrying a tray, and I, I couldn't defend myself. And he took a picture of me while I was carrying this tray. And my two classmates said, hey, you want us to go jump them? We'll, we'll take them outside. We'll get the camera, and we'll take it. I said, no, 
I said, I, I don't want you to get in trouble. It's not worth it. We're catching a plane in just a few hours. Let's just get out of here. And that later, I, I labeled that as, you don't ever want to wrestle with a pig because then you both get muddy. So that's, in my mind, I didn't want my buddies to go to bat for me and wrestle with a pig because we'd all get in trouble. It was about three months later, my roommate, her boyfriend, graduated, went to ranger school. His first assignment was jungle warfare school as cadre. So he gets there, and he calls her that night. He said, you are not going to believe this. I just got down here in Panama. I'm looking on the bulletin board, and guess what I saw? I saw a picture of your roommate, me, on the bulletin board. He said, and underneath it, it said, this is what happens when women come here. I was like, he said, I ripped it down. He said, that, we're not going to tolerate that. But my question was, where was the picture of my male classmate? He knocked out his two front teeth and ripped off his lip. His face was all swollen. No, they, they only put my picture up there. So, okay, I got the diploma. I got the patch. And then I paved the way for other women to go to jump warfare school. So, I mean, for me, that was redemption enough, but it, it hurt to know that they were laughing at me and making fun of me because I had broken my nose. So no, I had no clue I wanted to be a general. I didn't even know if I wanted to stay in, in, at West Point. That was my second year at West Point. All right? I was 19 with two broken spots in my nose. I get home, my dad sees me, he goes berserk. Brings me immediately to Albany Medical Center. And they take one look at me and they said, they should have reset your nose. And I'm like, don't touch my nose. I'm not, and what, that means they want to break it again for you. I'm like, no, thank you. I think it looks fine. They took all the stitching out because it would have left just huge holes. They used this force thread on me. And they put like Surja tape on there. So it ended up turning out pretty good. But anyway, that's, you know, again, my dad and my mom being there for me, encouraging me along the way, and then always looking out for me. And back then we didn't have cell phones. So the only message I could give him from the payphone was, when you see me, I had a little accident. So don't get too upset. All right, so when they both burst out screaming in the truck stop, it was quite traumatic. But anyway, <laughs> we made it through. Um, it's, what are some reasons that you've won the awards and decorations? Yeah, awards and decorations are... You don't seek them out. They just find you. I mean, I, I didn't, all these things hanging on my wall. Uh, I earned my diplomas, but I, that bottom flag there, that, that was a soldier that just got back from Afghanistan this past August. He's a student here at KSU. And I had helped him override his course schedule in order to take 22 credit hours, and you're only allowed 21. But he was trying to use his GI Bill benefits, and he had to get it done in the semester. So I got with the registrar and said, no, but trust me, let him take the extra course. He will do well. He sent me an email last week. He got four A's and a B. So he did do well. But that's, I, mean, I, I didn't ask for that. He thought of that. He brought that to me. Uh, you know, these little war trophies up here, 48th Brigade, you know, the brigade commander came back with the sergeant major and presented those to me. Uh, any military awards that I got, I always had faith that my leadership would recognize what I was trying to do and why I was trying to do it and take care of me. And for the most part, that always worked out. I was either promoted or given an award. And, and when you get awards, it's not about you because you can't do anything by yourself. It's always about your team. And so to me, getting an award was something I could share with my soldiers. It was like, you know, you be proud. I, I wouldn't have gotten this. It's not me. It's about you. It's about the organization and what we've done together. So, no awards are great, but to me they don't really, they don't mean a lot because they're not about me. Um, I wear them proudly for my organization. How many years did it take you to get where you are now? I was in the military for 28 years. So I became a general, uh, let's see, I was a general for four years, so 24 years to make general officer, which is about right. 
So that's the other thing about women. See, they just started letting women in service academy 30, 35 years ago. So now this generation is just seeing its first female generals, and we're going to continue to see more and more female generals. Just because it takes that long. It takes 30 years to grow a general. Um, we know that you have held many other leadership positions in your career. What were some of your other firsts, and what barriers did you have to overcome? Okay, well, the, the barriers were always about pretty much being the first woman to do something. So, let me think of another example. Okay, I'm Fort Hood, Texas, right? I'm, let's see, just got out of West Point, so I'm, I'm 21 years old. First assignment, I'm a platoon leader, military police. So we don't just stop them and cuff them. You know, it's, it's more than just being a police officer. You're also in charge of the rear area security for any kind of battlefield. So our one of our missions about six, maybe eight months into my time at Fort Hood, which Fort Hood is huge and it's armor, right? It's all these big tread vehicles and you know, guys that like to drive those things are really excited about being guys <laughs> so you know they're they're just like you know the most manly men you can find love doing this armor stuff which I drove a tank once in cadet training and I was so glad I was a woman I was like there's no way I'd want to even be in this I felt like a sardine in a can and then every time you would fire around and the smoke and that you gotta stay out of the way when it, it does the it it flashes back and if you're in the way it'll kill you so, <clears throat> river crossing, very dangerous operation at night. So they call the, the battalion and they say, hey, we want a platoon to come out and help us with the river crossing. That's military police. So you direct the traffic to make sure everybody's safe, nobody's running over anybody, backing up, any of that. I got picked. So I'm like, okay, great. Got my platoon sergeant, went out and did a reconnaissance, you know, do the recon, make sure everything's good, came up with a plan, rehearsed, ready to go, get out there, a little bit before it's going to start recording, get the call signs for the radio. And all of a sudden, my company commander's calling me back in with Intalman. It's like 15 miles, right? We're in these Jeeps with these open tops, and it's hot, and it's dusty. And I'm like, what? What? Right now, I'm, right, I'm getting ready to start my mission. So we drive all the way back in. I report into my company commander. Yes, sir, is there a problem? He said, well, actually, there is. He said, the assistant division commander said that he, he saw your report in and, well, they had asked for our best platoon leader. I said, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm honored. I was picked. And he said, yeah, but they were expecting a man. So, okay, sir. So, did you call me in here to relieve me of duty, to basically fire me from the mission? And I think he had. I think he was, that, because why else would he have me come all the way in? And, but when I looked at him, I challenged him, and I said, are you going to relieve me of duty, sir? And he couldn't do it. He looked at me, and he said, you know what? Go back out there and kick some ass. He said, go on. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, I was just seething. I was, I was angry, I was hurt, and I was scared. Because now I had no room to mess up, right? Because when guys mess up, oh. Good job, you push the envelope. You know, you're, you're going to learn from your mistakes, you're going to grow. Now, when a woman makes a mistake, it's a little bit different. Oh, look at her, she broke her nose. It's a double standard. All right, so now here I go back out there, and as the more we were traveling out, and even my driver who had heard the conversation, he's like, oh man, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to do what we were going to do before. We're going to do the mission. We're going to do it right, and we're going to get everybody back home safely. And that's what we did. And we didn't have any problems. It went off very well. I ended up getting a, a thank you note to my command for the job that we did. But you don't think that caused a little bit of stress in me. Because now, they, they wanted the best. They were expecting a man. Okay. Well, sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> I'm here. Right? So that it's just constantly having to build yourself back up and say, you know what? I'm good. I can do this. So that was one example. The next example... I'll say company commander at Fort McPherson. They had never had a female that was in charge of the military police unit out there. Because not only were you in charge of 250 men and women, but you were also the commander of troops, or the four-star general that commanded Forces Command. 
So in my case, it was General Burba, Edwin Burba. They got a highway named after him. All right, so he's out there. He's the four star. And my provost marshal is going to recommend me to be the company commander. The woman's never done it before. Because if you're a commander troop, you may not understand, but you're standing in front of your soldiers, your salute battery, right, the field artillery unit, the band. And you have to bark commands so that everybody can hear what you're doing and keep everybody in sync. So I go to interview for the job, and I'll never forget it, Colonel Gerald Lord. Know, from North Georgia, very strack, had a you know, really tough reputation at Fort McPherson. He was the garrison commander. So I go in the interview, and he was, uh, he was tough. The only question I remember, and of course you have to understand, I was eight months pregnant when I went to interview, which did not help my case, all right? Because the, the saying was that if they wanted you to have children, they would issue you children. I don't know where people expected babies to come from when you were in the military. But I interviewed and I was eight months pregnant. And the only question I remember him asking me was, can you lose the weight? And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I'm sure that's not a question he asks anybody else, but okay, I'll give it to him because I'm pregnant. He's probably never seen a pregnant captain who's gonna take this job and be the first female to do it. And I said, sir, I'm 25 pounds. I mean, that's nothing. It's all baby. And I, this is my second child, so I knew I could lose it pretty quickly. So he said, all right, I'll take a chance on you. I'll let you have the job in six months. So I did. I lost the weight, got back in shape, and then it's a lot of a uh, saber manual too, which I had at West Point. So first ceremony, get out there, bark at my commands, felt like it was pretty good. Knew I had missed a couple of cues, you have to memorize everything. <clears throat> He's standing at the corner of the parade field when I come off and dismiss the troops. <laughs> And I'm like, oh boy, okay, he wants to talk to me, all right? He's getting all rustled up. So I went over and reported him, yes, sir. Um, how did I do, sir? And he's like, well, if, you know, you made this mistake, you made that mistake, you heard that. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll do better next time. All right? So then I, I kind of feel bad about it, but I'm like, you know, shake it off. It's like that Taylor Swift song. <laughs> I love that song. <laughs> you gotta shake it off, right? You can't let it get you down. Shake it off. So I shook it off, came back the next month. Every month it was a ceremony. Next month, there he is again. This time I know, just go. Get it over with, listen to what he's got to say, improve. Use it as self-development. Yes, sir, got it, sir. Next month, same thing. It's happened four months in a row. Finally the fifth month, right? I'm like, oh, this is getting old, but you know what? I'm doing all right, I'm staying here, I'm commanding, I'm leading, this is cool. Go back up to him and, yes sir, any comments today, sir? And he just looked at me and said, no, you did it perfectly. Oh, huh. thanks sir. <laughs> Finally, right? So, and then after that, he was never there. So, I had to prove myself and get through that. And he was watching me like a hawk probably more so than would have watched any other man that was in that job. But that's okay. I got better because of it. And in the end, you know, we still stay in touch and, and we still respect each other very much. And he's very happy for me. In fact, he sent me a wonderful note when I got promoted to general officer. So he feels he's a part of my development, and he was. So that was a, you know, and then I was the first female battalion commander in the Georgia Army National Guard, which really isn't that big of a deal to me because the Guard didn't have that many women to begin with that were in nine units. So anything I did in the Guard was pretty much going to be the first woman doing anything because I was it. I mean, I, I was like the first major and I was the, the first battalion commander. I was the first G1, director of personnel, first chief of staff, and then the first general officer and the first commanding general. There'll be women behind me someday. I tried to some bench strength, but I think it's probably been set back a little bit, but we'll see. Based on your success in moving through the ranks, do you feel you have opened the path or made it easier for other female soldiers to follow? Oh, definitely. definitely. And I've had women tell me, you know, because you were battalion commander, in fact, the, the person that followed me in company command at Fort McPherson was another woman. And, and she told me, she said, I never would have gotten this job if you hadn't already blazed the way because I'm not as good as you, but I'm good enough. 
And I was like, Marlena, not in debt, you can do this. So yes, I mean, I, I always felt like, if not me, then who? If I quit and I, I let them look at women a certain way, and I don't help change their perception one person at a time, then whoever comes behind me is going to pay the price. So definitely, I and mean, we've had female battalion commanders. Um, I don't think we've had a female brigade commander yet in the Georgia Guard, but we'll get there, or they'll get there. I mean, it was 20 years of my life, so it's hard for me to still not feel a part of an organization that I helped grow. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, and let me just add that, you know, as a woman in any field, you just you have to work harder and you have to work smarter. And to me, having two master's degrees helped me, one, get to war college, and then it just made me a better person. So I, I would suggest always continue with your education no matter what you do. Don't stop at the four year, go on and get the master's degree, maybe two masters, maybe a certificate, maybe a PhD. But just keep going because those degrees mean a lot and they give you the credentials that men physically see and say, oh, okay, they can't argue with that. All right? And I, I even had a gentleman that was trying to run me out of West Point and it was eight years later. In fact, it was on that parade field when I was the company commander. He, came, he was my tactical officer at West Point and he would take us out for runs and he would make our runs harder and longer. Well, my roommate and I were both cross country runners. We ran for fun on weekends. The only people dropping out of the runs were the men. So after a while, it'd be him and my roommate and I, <laughs> all the guys were dropping out. So here we are eight years later, and he's working for General Burba. And he comes up to me after a ceremony, and I'm telling you, I, I could just feel you know the blood pressure in my face when I saw him, because he had gone way out of his way to make our life miserable. And he came up to me and he said, uh, Captain Brett, he said, do you remember me? And I said, yes, sir, I remember you. And I was trying, you know, just to not let him know what I thought of him, but he probably already knew. He said, well, he said, I, I just want to tell you that I'm sorry. He said, I, I was trying to run you out of West Point. And I said, yes, sir, I knew what you were trying to do. He said, but you and your roommate, helped change my mind about women in the military and specifically at West Point. He said, you earned your right to be there. He said, and now that I'm in the Army, we need women in the Army. We need female leaders. We need you as a part of diversity of our thinking and our operations. He said, I was so wrong, and I apologize. And if there's anything I can ever do to make it up to you, he said, I, I want to do it. He asked me. He said, ask me for something. I want to do something for you in return. And when I finished that company command after 18 months, six of it being grilled by this colonel that was giving me feedback after every ceremony, this major came up to me and said, how would you like it if I had General Burwell come to your uh, change of command ceremony and pin you with your meritorious service medal? And I was like, you can do that, sir? And he's like, if, if he's available, I'll see if I can get him to do it, because you've been doing all his ceremonies and he's been very impressed with you. Well, General Burba did come to my ceremony, and he did pin me with my MSM, and that was my first MSM. And my parents were there, very proud of me. So he made it up to me, and I thanked him for that, and I'll never forget that act of kindness in return for all that, that misery that he had bestowed. out. But again, it was impersonal. I just happened to be the one in his unit. So, and, and then General Burba and I, we see each other once a year at our West Point Founders Day, and I always go up to him and be like, Mario, <laughs> cool over there, I'm so proud of you. And, and he's just a great guy. So, yeah, it's been a great career. People say, you know, do you regret being in the military? Do you regret going to West Point? And my answer is always no. You know, I, even if I'd known how it was all going to end, I, I still would have done it. You know, it's still like, that Garth Brooks song, you still do the dance, right? Even though in the end you know how it ends. But I had a great 28 years, and then four years before that at West Point, so 32 years in uniform. And I loved every minute of it because I was serving soldiers. Soldiers like your dad, you know, guys that I'm so proud of. What about your stint as the first chief of staff 
in the Georgia Army National Guard. That's right. With, with yeah. all these uh, men colonels. <laughs> right. My whole lead team were men, and but you know by now I've kind of gotten used to just working with men, and and some of them you can tell if. If they really support you and they really believe in what you're trying to do, and then you've got others that will just patronize you and, and pay you lip service, is what I call it. Uh, but you figure it out pretty quickly. And then either you get those guys off of your team somehow, or you win them over with what you're trying to do by getting them to be a part of the process. And then five brigade commanders, so they were all men. And then every direct report on my staff, from the, the personnel side to the intelligence, logistics, <laughs> Uh, the resource managers, I mean, and, and all these guys have been doing this for a while and, and a lot of ego attached to their job and their titles and I, I never led, I never felt I led from an egoistic standpoint. It was always, where are we going as an organization? What's the vision? Let's look at our values and then let's move forward. We've got to build readiness because we've got to send our soldiers out the door the most ready they can be, whether it's how they're equipped, how they're trained, how they're led. And especially to me, the medical and dental readiness, because the way we were sending our soldiers to war, pulling their teeth out, loading them up on airplanes, I, I just, I couldn't bear it anymore. So I, I worked extra hard to send them as medically fit, and then also to get them the dental care. I turned all of our armories into dentist offices on weekends, much to the chagrin of many of my uh, male leaders who thought it was a waste of time. But we actually had dentist office come in and set up and put crowns on teeth and save teeth and or pull teeth, put implants in, fill cavities. We took care of our soldiers. And I, I'll tell you, the soldiers were appreciative, but those spouses, their wives primarily, were very appreciative that our organization had taken care of their husbands and gotten them that dental care. Because not most people don't have dental insurance. And it's expensive. So to have your teeth taken care of and not have to give out a mouthful of teeth just to go serve your country, I thought was a very small price for us to pay. So yeah, it's, um, you know, but I, I, I never let it bother me that it was men. That, you know, they're, they want to do the right thing too. They just need leadership. I'm a leader. I didn't see myself as a woman. I saw myself as a leader. And sometimes you have to help others see you as a leader because they might want to see you as a woman. And then you have to be extra professional and you have to create that distance and it's more stress on you to create the barriers there to stay as a leader. But you figure it out as you go. I had a question. Mm -hmm. I know that the Georgia Guard was part of the missions in Iraq and Afghanistan right. over the last 10 or 12 years, mm -hmm. 15 years. Um, were you able to go with any of those units or be over there with them or did you just support them on this side? Yeah, I was, you know, and, th and this is a hard part because I was already a colonel when the war started. I got promoted actually the day before 9-11. Oh, and so I was already the G1 mm -hmm. and then I was the chief of staff. So it would have meant me giving up being the chief of staff or maybe putting off becoming the commanding general in order to deploy and I would have had to have volunteered to go in some capacity and mm -hmm. make up a job like sometimes our colonels would do which to me I always felt if we need you here taking care of families and employers and, and soldiers that were in the rear detachments just as important. Okay. So no, <clears throat> I never deployed. I, you know, I, do I wish I had? Sure, just so that I wouldn't have to say I didn't deploy. Right. Right. but. The job that I had here, I've had commanders come back and tell me they, they were glad they were over there when we had 37 casualties. So I was on this end trying to keep it together with families and funerals and casualty assistance officers and you know just the, the wake of destruction every time a fallen hero came home. I mean, it, it was emotionally exhausting. And, and sometimes I would think, you know, wouldn't it be nice to just deploy? I know it's difficult and I know there's stressors there and you're away from your family. Mm -hmm. But you've got one job and you've got one focus. You're not back here trying to hold down all these different pieces. Meanwhile, you're getting the next group ready to deploy. So it's you don't ever just take a knee. You have to keep going. 
and you got to keep the team motivated because it's very demoralizing when you're bringing people back home in that state. And then the post-traumatic stress and the whole suicide watch and having a triple R chaplain team to have a, a crisis response force. And I, you know, I, I didn't deploy. I was needed on this end. I talked to my boss about going, and he was just like, you know, get out of here. <laughs> if, if not you, then who? You're the best person to get them ready to go. And to me, I'd rather send our best team forward than have you over there and not doing what we need to do to get our soldiers ready. And also, my, my ex-husband did deploy for a year while I was a general officer. It was my first year as a general. So not only you know, did I not go, but now I've got to support him going. And his mother lived with us, by the way. So now I'm, I'm taking care of his mother, our three children, and I'm a brand new general officer in this organization that <laughs> is still taking shots at me from every angle they could. All right, so, yeah, uh, I mean, sure, I, I really would have liked to have deployed. Yeah. I just, I <laughs> At least I know where the enemy was. Yeah. <laughs> and then I had one more question, and I, I said a little bit to this, to the girls earlier in the car, but I noticed in one of the things that we had pulled off, let me see, I marked it, that you continue to do work with, um, uh, veterans issues and the Presidential Commission here on Veterans Affairs right. um, and can you talk a little sure. bit more about your commitment to help the veterans and then also on here the the Coles College of Business Women's Leadership Center and how you continue to work and, right. and help pave the way sure. with women is even though you're out of the guard but you're in this position and, and, and your legacy moving forward right. for you. Well, that's my two passions, soldiers and, and women, especially women in leadership, because I've been there and I know how hard it is. We have over 2,000 student veterans here on campus, so it, it didn't take long for them to know I was here. You know, for example, Rusty calling me from Afghanistan to say, ma'am, I need your help. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a wonderful veteran resource center here. It's a one-stop shop for veterans to help them get their certificate of eligibility for their education and help them through the process. It's, it's kind of a green zone, a safe zone for them. So I, I partner with them. I'm here for them. They know they can reach out to me if they have an issue. Uh, we just had an issue with a, a student veteran came to see me two weeks ago because VA isn't paying for their meal plan anymore with the post-9-11 benefits. I mean, how are they supposed to eat? So this kid, had his meal plan covered this past semester. He gets a note from KSU saying, we can't cover your food next semester because of the VA ruling. He thinks it's KSU. And so then I get involved with the Registrar of Financial Aid, try to figure out what we can do. And we're still working that. In fact, I called downtown to our university office to see if they would at least give us a grace period so that these soldiers that have served our country can eat right. next semester. It's ridiculous. So those are the sorts of things that are not at all in my job description but I get involved with it because it aggravates me if I feel like our soldiers aren't getting treated the way they should be treated. So and then the president, uh, Dan Papp, started a President's Commission on Veteran Affairs because he wants to know what else can we do for veterans. And I'm on that commission as well. We also started Georgia's Advancing Veteran Education. It's a, a free program through the Coles College to allow veterans who want to start a business, entrepreneurs, to come in and get this one week boot camp of training and then get a one year mentorship uh, relationship with our EDGE. Nice. And so we had three graduates that were from the National Guard and I was very proud of them. And one was a military police sergeant that's starting his own security business. And he sat at my table at the graduation and he, he remembered me and we, we talked about the old days. So I mean, you just never know where you're gonna make a connection. I have many, I'll say many, probably a dozen either majors, lieutenant colonels, colonels that have come to see me that needed help with references or jobs. Uh, I brought them over and had an interview with the colleges here and the deans. Uh, two of them got picked up for adjunct professorships. So, you know, I, I do what I can. In fact, this soldier ended up getting picked up by our police department. He started work two weeks ago because he didn't have a job. So I'm like, oh, okay, let me let you know where we've got some vacancies. So whatever I can do, it, it's really just one veteran at a time and what I can do to help them. And I try to stay in touch as much as I can. Uh, as far as women in leadership, I mean, that's, 
I work with the Women Leadership Center, but probably more importantly, I lecture for our executive MBA program. And it's men and women, but it, it resonates with both of them. And, and the women will, will tend to come up to me after, or the military men, it's really cool. Because there's always four or five that have served or are serving. In fact, the current class has a captain in it that's in the guard. And somehow I got assigned as his mentor, so now we're having regular mentoring sessions so I can help him. But the, the women really, they want to hear more. So how did you overcome that? How did you re-motivate yourself? I mean, it, that's got to be grueling to be knocked down and, and retested in every assignment you went in. You know, just like you got to have that inner strength and you got to believe in yourself. You, you know where your true north is. You know, don't deviate from it. Don't let somebody else help you de deviate from it. It just, in fact, I, I talked to a, a woman that came to see me Friday, and she was in tears because her boss had said some comments to her that hurt her feelings. And I was like, you know what? Don't let other people dictate your response. You know you're doing the right thing. He's just trying to get in your head and mess with you. Don't let him, don't let him do it. And, and she was like, you know what, you're right. I am trying to attach my self-worth to how he feels about the job that I am doing. And I know I'm doing a great job. I'm like, you are. And if you weren't, I would tell you. But you are doing a great job. This is not about you. This is about him. And you looking good at his expense. I said, believe me, I've been there and done that too. So don't dumb yourself down so your boss feels better about it. You do what you've got to do and you stand your ground. And she called me later and she said, you know, I've been thinking about what you told me all day long. And she said, you are so right and I will never let that happen again. I will not sit there and cry because he brought me down. I will not let him do that to me again. So, it's, but it, it's just having to go through it. It's, you won't get it right the first two or three times, but then you'll think about what I told you. And you'll say, you know what, I can do this. I'm better than this. And I can control my response. How do you feel about women in the combat arms? I've always been in the combat arms. I mean, I, to me, it's I was military police. We were out there. We were leading them to the battlefield. You know, they can call it what they want. That I was military intelligence. You know, the women are out there. There is no battle line anymore. There, there's not a, a front line. It's IEDs. You know, it's asymmetric. It's it's cyber warfare. So I, we've had what, over 150 women killed in combat, uh, several awarded for bravery. Well, if it's there, you do it. It doesn't matter if you're on a front line or not. So I say don't lower the standards. Just open the door. And the women that can step up and do the infantry, can do the ranger school, they'll do it. Now, it may not have been me, and it cer certainly isn't going to be my daughters, but there is a woman out there, and there are women out there that want to step up and do that. When they started letting women on these uh, advanced teams to do the searches in Afghanistan because the men didn't want our male soldiers touching their women, but the men were dressing up as women and hiding guns underneath their burkas because they knew our men couldn't touch them. So then they said, ah, we'll add women to these infantry teams and send them in, special forces. And they did. And then the women showed up, and they could pat down the women, and sometimes the men that were dressed like women, and save hundreds of lives by doing that. And I talked to one of those female soldiers, and she said it was tough at first. And then, you know, just, it took probably two weeks for them to finally accept her, and to see the value, and for them not to get blown up one time because she was there and was able to figure it out. And then they were sold on the idea. So that's all it takes. It's just, you know, one perception at a time, sometimes one retirement at a time. You just have to be patient.